Immaterialism is a subject that I've alluded to in a couple of other videos but haven't gone into too much depth on. My reference to it has caused a lot of confusion for some people, especially materialistic atheists. They incorrectly suppose that I'm proposing that there exists some immaterial substance along with material substance. And then, of course, they challenge me to prove that some non-material substance exists. And they want me to define and prove the existence of this non-material substance in terms of materialism. And this is very simple for me to do. I ask them if consciousness is material or immaterial. Of course, materialistic atheists absolutely hate the mystery of consciousness. No matter how hard they close their eyes and wish that consciousness could be explained in a materialistic framework, it just can't be done. This is why they attacked me so intensely when I published my video in response to Anti-Citizen X's challenge to proponents of free will. They attacked me as furiously as fundamentalist Christians attack evolutionists, and for the same reasons. In my video entitled, why the death of Jesus was in vain, I explain why evolution challenges not only a literalist interpretation of Genesis, but also the central doctrine of the literalist Christian church. I use the word literalist because there are also esoteric interpretations of the biblical myths and symbols, and esoteric Christianity is not threatened by evolution or any other verified scientific theory but materialistic atheists are just another flavor of literalist. They are naive realists. They take their sense perceptions literally. They have a faith-based belief that their mental perceptions, which exist inside their minds, correspond to physical realities, which exist outside their minds. This is unverifiable and unfalsifiable. Therefore, it is a faith-based belief. They'll never admit this to themselves, though, and they get very angry when it's pointed out to them. Suddenly, they know how religious people feel when their core beliefs are challenged, and they respond in that same predictable manner. Scientific-minded atheists like to talk about themselves as rationalists and proponents of reason, but they're not rationalists. They're empiricists. Their worldview isn't based on reason. It's based on the senses. And when their senses come into conflict with reason, they consistently reject reason and cling to their sensory illusions. And as long as they're trapped in these illusions, they'll be confused when I speak to them of the real world. If you've seen the movie The Matrix, and I imagine most people have, imagine if Neo told someone who hadn't been unplugged about Zion. They might ask him where inside the matrix Zion is located. They might challenge him to prove that Zion exists inside the matrix. When he tells them that they are actually lying unconscious inside of a pod in a vast field where humans are grown like crops as a source of energy for machines, and that what they believe to be their body is just the digital projection of their mental self, he could never prove any of this to them through their senses. Their senses only confirm the reality of the matrix, which is an illusion. Their senses cannot tell them about reality. Only reason can. But ultimately, they can only attain true knowledge through the experience of liberation from the matrix. We might call this true knowledge through direct experience, illumination. Someone who has experienced illumination is free from all doubt. Neo can never be caused to question his belief in a reality outside of the matrix. He can never accept the deluded claims of those who are still plugged in that the matrix is real and is all that exists. Even if he fails to counter all of their arguments in a debate, and even if his arguments fail to persuade them, he is still right and they are still wrong, objectively right and wrong. This truth isn't subjective or a matter of faith, but knowledge. With all of that said, let me get into the heart of the matter 
an attempt to give an introduction to immaterialism. With materialists, I find it easiest to begin by defining immaterialism in terms of what it is not. It is not the belief in something other than or in addition to matter. It's the rejection of the belief in matter. An atheist should have no problem with this. Immaterialism is to materialism as atheism is to theism. If you ask an atheist to prove atheism, he'll claim that the burden of proof lies with the theist, who's making the positive truth claim that God exists. And in the absence of such proof, disbelief is the default position. So I present immaterialism to him or her in the same way. The burden of proof lies with the materialist, who is making the positive truth claim that matter exists. In the absence of such proof, disbelief is the default position. Immaterialism is the lack of belief in matter, just as atheism is the lack of belief in God or gods. The materialist, not the immaterialist, has the burden of proof. Not only is there no proof that materialism is true, but there are logical proofs that materialism is false. Berkeley proposed several, and so have others. I've given several in other videos, so I, I won't repeat them all here. In addition to challenging materialists to prove the existence of this imaginary substance that they call matter, I've challenged them to define what this so-called matter is. The most common and agreed upon scientific definition is any substance that has mass and volume. Okay, great. So matter has mass and volume, but what is matter? Mass and volume are really just measurements of matter. This doesn't tell us what so-called matter is. Defining matter as something that can be measured by weight and volume is like defining time as something that can be measured in minutes and seconds. So we're defining time and matter in terms of numbers, but what is it that we're measuring in numbers? So will materialists admit that they still haven't defined matter and are unable to do so? Or will they insist upon their definition and accept that matter is nothing more than numbers? that numbers themselves define matter, and therefore the whole of the material universe. Thousands of years ago, Pythagoras stated that all is number. Math itself is what the universe is made of. And what is volume? All of geometry begins with a point. A point is dimensionless. It is zero-dimensional, just like a photon. If materialists insist on denying the existence of immaterial objects, and they define material objects as having volume, then they must deny the existence of photons. No wonder they're not enlightened. They don't believe that light exists. A point, extended in one dimension, becomes a line. A line is one-dimensional. A line, extended in two dimensions, becomes a plane. An example would be a circle. A circle is two-dimensional. It has area, but not volume. A plane, extended into three dimensions, gives us three-dimensional space. This is where cubes, spheres, and other objects, defined by volume, exist. So according to materialist, only what is defined by volume exists. But volume is defined by planes which aren't material and therefore don't exist. And planes are defined by lines, which aren't material and therefore don't exist. And lines are defined by points, which aren't material and therefore don't exist. So if they want to define matter in this way, then I've demonstrated mathematically that matter is immaterial. A cube is the extension of a two-dimensional square into three dimensions. A square is an extension of a one-dimensional line segment into two dimensions, and a line segment is the extension of a zero-dimensional point 
into one dimension. Everything is made of dimensionless points, zeros, which are immaterial, immeasurable, and therefore don't exist according to materialism. It turns out the universe was created out of nothing after all. Scientists, philosophers, and theologians all struggle with the riddle of how something can come from nothing. The answer is simple when posed in mathematical terms. Something can't come from nothing, but everything can. Mathematically, nothing is zero. If we agree that the universe is made up of numbers, then to create the universe out of nothing is to create all numbers out of zero. I can easily demonstrate this because the entire number set is included in the definition of zero. Every number is a sum. Two equals one plus one. Two is made of two ones. Five equals two plus three. Five contains both two and three. If two and three exist, then five exists. And if five exists, then two and three exist. So what about zero? Zero equals one minus one. Put differently, zero is the sum of positive one and negative one. Zero is the sum of every number and its negative. Zero is the sum of positive infinity and negative infinity. In other words, zero contains all positive numbers and all negative numbers. This is why the symbol for zero is the shape of an egg. It's the cosmic egg from which all of existence comes into being. This is something that's long been understood by esoteric schools. If you look back over the history of math, zero was the subject of heated debate. Why so much fuss over a number? Muslims and Jews say that God is one. Christians say that God is three in one. To say that God is zero is heresy to them both. Ironically, atheists correctly identify God as zero when they deny that he exists. But I don't want to get into the topic of God's non-existence for now or whether or not and to what degree the word God is even useful. When I speak of God, I only mean mind, with a capital M. Arguably, the word God implies things that the word mind does not. And I'm not arguing for the existence of God in any sense that would either interest theologians or challenge atheists. I'm talking about the dimensionless or unextended point from which the dimensional or extended world emanates. Descartes defined mind as unextended and matter as extended. This doesn't imply substance dualism. Matter is extended mind. When materialists say that matter has volume, they're saying the same thing in different words without understanding what they're saying. Since I've explained that volume is merely extension of a dimensionless or unextended point into one, then two, then three dimensions. The material universe, then, is the extension of mind. Materialists will never succeed in explaining mind in materialistic terms. Instead, matter can only be explained in immaterialistic terms. Reductionistic, materialistic, deterministic scientists will never and could never in principle explain the emergence of mind and consciousness and free will from a dead unconscious material universe. The material universe can only be explained as emerging from mind. This is a logical and mathematical truth. But scientific minded materialists who are still plugged into the matrix and who rely on their senses rather than on reason as the basis for knowledge, will be blind to this fact and remain in ignorance. The new atheists claim to promote reason. They are the enemies of reason. They deny reason and appeal to the senses, which can never tell them anything whatsoever about truth. No scientific experiment conducted by scientists inside the matrix can reveal anything whatsoever about reality or even reveal to them what the matrix itself is. They can only observe and draw inductive conclusions about the regularities and patterns that exist within the matrix. 
They will gather some indirect and probabilistic knowledge about the rules that govern the computer program. And that may prove very useful and have practical applications inside the matrix. So I'm not saying it's a waste of time. But to think that it can answer the big questions and lead us to knowledge of truth is delusional. But the matrix, the program itself, is a mathematical code. This is why physicists are forced to use mathematical equations to describe the material universe. The immaterial is eternal. Even materialists say, unthinkingly sometimes, that the laws of math are eternal. Are the laws of math material? Photons have no volume. They define matter as having volume. So are photons, is light, material? Mind, consciousness, is unextended. Like light and mathematics, mind belongs to the eternal realm. The ancient Gnostics and other esoteric schools describe the ultimate reality beyond the material world of sensory illusion as an eternal realm of light and as the true home of the soul. Materialists deny this eternal realm of light because it isn't material. It isn't extended. It's dimensionless. So they deny the soul. They deny consciousness. They deny free will. They deny the dimensionless light of reason. They reject reason and trust in their senses. Then, having rejected reason themselves, they accuse the religious of having rejected reason. And it's true that the religious have rejected reason, too. The religious type is ruled by feeling, sentimentalism. The scientific type is ruled by sensing, sensualism. The philosopher is ruled by reason. The reason why materialists are determinists who deny free will is because their will is directed by their senses. Free will requires that the will be directed by reason. Imagine a man riding a horse. The man is the reasoning faculty in man. The bridle and reins represent the will. The horse is the passions and desires which arise from the senses. To borrow from Christian language, the carnal man, the materialist, is ruled by the flesh. In his unenlightened state, he is spiritually dead in sin. His actions are causally determined by the desires of the flesh, which arise from his senses. He is a slave to the powers that govern the material realm. The enlightened man is free. Free will is the man, reason, taking control of the reins, the will, and leading the horse, instead of being led by the horse. The determinist is a man who sits on the horse but doesn't hold the reins. He observes that he is powerless to direct the horse, and so concludes that he has no free will. He has an external locus of control. He assumes that no other rider is able to steal his horse either, and denies that anyone has free will. He thinks anyone who has an internal locus of control is deluded. Because he himself is a slave, he denies that other men are free. Rather than escape from prison himself, he wills that all men be imprisoned. Anyone still plugged into the matrix is potentially an agent, as Morpheus tells us. And this has implications in the social and political arenas. Determinist and materialist are statist, usually. Feminist are deterministic. They deny female agency. Women are acted upon, in their view. Everything happens to women. Women themselves are powerless victims of the patriarchy. Liberals say that black people lack agency as well. They are not responsible for their own lives. They are the victims of some white racist conspiracy. No problem within the black community is ever caused by choices made by black people themselves. White people are to blame for everything. America is to blame for everything in the world. Non-Americans apparently are not free agents. Of course these victim narratives aren't consistently deterministic. The evil white men have free will and can therefore be blamed and held responsible for the conditions affecting women and blacks. America can be blamed 
for every other nation's problems. Let me make it clear that I'm in no way insulting women and blacks. I believe that women are free, just like men are. I believe that blacks are free agents, just like whites, Asians, and members of other races are. It's feminism that is insulting to women. It's the myth of black victimization and white racism that is insulting to blacks. I'm also not denying that women have been the victims of sexism. So have men, though. I'm not denying that blacks have been the victims of racism. So have whites and other races. The American government has done things and is still doing things that I don't support and even strongly oppose. And I can say the same thing of other nations. But to be free is to take responsibility. So as long as you deny yourself personal responsibility, stop complaining that you're not free. We should have a statue of responsibility next to the Statue of Liberty. She could scare off the immigrants who only come here to abuse our welfare programs. And I'm not saying that applies to all immigrants, obviously. It applies to a lot of citizens, too. Determinists deny that they have free will. But as I've shown, their determinism is never held consistently. When a determinist argues with someone who believes in free will, they always seem to place blame on the person who believes in free will. The determinist believes that the person who believes in free will is wrong, and the determinist seems to hold the person who believes in free will responsible for their belief in free will. And in trying to convince the person to accept determinism, the determinist is demonstrating an underlying belief that the person is free to do so. So determinism is always inconsistent. The determinist always denies their own responsibility while desiring to hold others responsible. They are never guilty. Someone else always is. They demand to be forgiven, yet refuse to forgive. The morally consistent attitude would be, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The more generalized moral principle is expressed as the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the moral application of a mathematical principle. In the Fibonacci sequence related to the golden ratio, each number in the sequence relates to the number before it in the same way that the number after it relates to it. Each number is the sum of the two previous numbers and each number added to its predecessor produces its successor. That sounds complicated, but it's not. All I mean is 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, and 5 plus 3 is 8, 8 plus 5 is 13. So in sequence, we have 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And you can work out for yourself what the next numbers in the sequence would be. 21, 34, 55, 89, and so on into eternity. The ratio between each successive number pair more perfectly approximates phi as the sequence progresses toward infinity. If you're unfamiliar with phi or the golden ratio, you might enjoy doing some research for yourself and learning more about it. It's found everywhere in the universe, and I mean everywhere. But you can see, hopefully, that ethics is related to mathematics. Morality is not subjective then. Virtuous actions are actions which are in harmony with the laws that govern the universe. Math. It's no surprise that atheistic, materialistic, deterministic individuals are usually moral relativist as well. Even though they still demand that others be virtuous toward them and may even act virtuously themselves. I'm not saying that materialists can't behave morally. They can even justify their sense of morality to a certain extent. But ultimately, morality is unjustifiable if their worldview is true. I've given a pragmatic defense of the golden rule in other videos, such as my video entitled The Moral Argument for God. You may also be interested in my video Escape from the Garden of Ignorance in which I present the argument in the form of a satirical dialogue based on the Garden of Eden story. But now I've presented an ontological argument as well, which is rooted in the immaterialist model of the universe. 
So which model of the universe is superior? Which offers the best explanation of reality? Materialism or immaterialism? Materialism can't be proven. It can be logically disproven. Materialists can't even define matter. And when they try, they're forced to define matter in terms of the immaterial. They can't explain or account for consciousness, free will, morality, or meaning. Immaterialists can. The existence of matter can't be proven. The existence of mind can't be doubted. Descartes proved that the existence of mind is the one thing we can be absolutely certain of, yet materialism denies the existence of mind. So are you going to believe in what can't be proven and deny what can't be doubted? If you're a materialist, then your answer is yes. If you decide instead to believe in what can't be doubted and deny what can't be proven, then you're an immaterialist and you trust in reason. And reason leads us to a seemingly paradoxical truth. Nothing exists. Because nothing exists, everything exists. Everything includes both everything and its opposite, which in some still amounts to nothing. But this nothing is something. It's everything. It's the all. In this perfect mind, the union of all opposites is achieved and is the source of all that is or will ever be. This mystery is encoded in the Genesis creation myth, in which the pairs of opposites are separated, light from darkness, earth from sky, sea from dry land, woman from man, etc. The knowledge of good and evil is the knowledge of the universe as the one divided, and became the ten thousand things, as the Taoist sage would say. Man is separated from God, his true self, the one and the soul finds itself cast out from its true home, the eternal realm of light and spirit or mind, and imprisoned in a body of flesh, or clothed in animal skins, where it experiences suffering in a world of darkness or matter. Plato expressed this view too, the view that the soul is immortal and that the body is like a prison or tomb. This is also why in the gospel story, baby Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes, Swaddling cloths were for dead people. Read the story of Lazarus. The symbolism here implies that birth, or the incarnation of the soul into the material world, is actually death for the spirit. This is a profound mystery. You'll also find that the symbols related to physical death and spiritual resurrection involve similar juxtapositions. Consider, for example, the curtain of the Holy of Holies being torn at the moment of his death. The inner temple is the birth canal, or the womb. The inner and outer courts are the labia minora and majora. The curtain is the hymen. The symbols here are connected with the inner mystery of the virgin birth. Yes, the Jewish temple is female genitalia. And the high priests have never found the G-spot and completely ignore the clitoris. Is this surprising? Sexual symbols are used in religion all around the world very explicitly in Hindu temples. I won't fully delve into this in any more depth here. I'm touching on some very esoteric stuff here that goes way beyond the purpose of this video. And while I enjoy discussing esoteric religion myths and symbols, philosophy is my first love. The philosophy of immaterialism is not in any way derived from esoteric religion. Immaterialism is a rational worldview arrived at through reason and experience. Esoteric religion is ultimately about transforming consciousness through mystical experiences of the transcendent. Philosophy is intellectual. Esoteric religion is experiential. Orthodox religion is neither intellectual nor experiential. It blunts the intellect of the believer while robbing him of the capacity for mystical experience and offers him empty dogmas and rituals as consolation. Scientific materialism makes reason a slave to the senses and offers freedom from responsibility in the place of true freedom and meaning. Immaterialism is not blind faith, sentimental beliefs, nor is it irresponsibility and meaninglessness. It's not being blinded by your feelings or bound by your senses. I'll end with that. Like, comment, 
share, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.